Random House Audio presents Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. Read for you by Jeremy Irons. Lolita, or the Confession of a White Widowed Male. Such were the two titles under which the writer of the present note received the strange pages it preambulates. Humbert Humbert, their author, had died in legal captivity of coronary thrombosis on November the 16th, 1952, a few days before his trial was scheduled to start. His lawyer, my good friend and relation, Clarence Choate Clark Esquire, now the District of Columbia Bar, in asking me to edit the manuscript, based his request on a clause in his client's will, which empowered my eminent cousin to use his discretion in all matters pertaining to the preparation of Lolita for print. Mr. Clark's decision may have been influenced by the fact that the editor of his choice had just been awarded the polling prize for a modest work, Do the Senses Make Sense, wherein certain morbid states and perversions had been discussed. My task proved simpler than either of us had anticipated, save for the correction of obvious solecisms and a careful suppression of a few tenacious details that, despite H.H.'s own efforts, still subsisted in his text as signposts and tombstones, indicative of places or persons that taste would conceal and compassion spare, this remarkable memoir is presented intact. Its author's bizarre cognomen is his own invention, and, of course, this mask, through which two hypnotic eyes seem to glow, had to remain unlifted in accordance with its wearer's wish. While Hayes only rhymes with the heroine's real surname, her first name is too closely interwound with the inmost fibre of the book to allow one to alter it. Nor, as the reader will perceive for himself, is there any practical necessity to do so. References to H. H.'s crime may be looked up by the inquisitive in the daily papers for September to October 1952. Its cause and purpose would have continued to remain a complete mystery had not this memoir been permitted to come under my reading lamp. For the benefit of old-fashioned readers who wish to follow the destinies of the real people beyond their true story, a few details may be given as received from Mr. Windmuller of Ramsdale, who desires his identity suppressed so that the long shadow of this sorry and sordid business should not reach the community to which he is proud to belong. His daughter, Louise, is by now a college sophomore. Mona Dahl is a student in Paris. Rita has recently married the proprietor of a hotel in Florida. Mrs. Richard F. Schiller died in childbed, giving birth to a stillborn girl on Christmas Day, 1952, in Grey Star, a settlement in the remotest northwest. Vivian Darkbloom has written a biography, My Q, to be published shortly, and critics who have perused the manuscript call it her best book. The caretakers of the various cemeteries involved report that no ghosts walk. Viewed simply as a novel, Lolita deals with situations and emotions that would remain exasperatingly vague to the reader had their expression been etiolated by means of platitudinous evasions. True, not a single obscene term is to be found in the whole work. Indeed, the robust Philistine who is conditioned by modern conventions into accepting without qualms the lavish array of four-letter words in a banal novel will be quite shocked by their absence here. If, however, for this paradoxical prude's comfort, an editor attempted to dilute or omit scenes that a certain type of mind might call aphrodisiac, See in this respect the monumental decision rendered December 6, 1933 by the Honourable John M. Woolsey in regard to another, considerably more outspoken book. One would have to forego the publication of Lolita altogether, since those very scenes that one might ineptly accuse of a sensuous existence of their own are the most strictly functional ones in the development of a tragic tale tending unswervingly to nothing less than a moral apotheosis. The cynic may say that commercial pornography makes the same claim. The learned may counter by asserting that H.H.'s impassioned confession is a tempest in a test tube, that at least 12% of American adult males, a conservative estimate according to Dr. Blanche Schwartzman, a verbal communication, enjoy yearly, in one way or another, the special experience H.H. H. describes with such despair.
that had our demented diarist gone in the fatal summer of 1947 to a competent psychopathologist, there would have been no disaster. But then, neither would there have been this book. This commentator may be excused for repeating what he has stressed in his own books and lectures, namely that offensive is frequently but a synonym for unusual. And a great work of art is, of course, always original, and thus, by its very nature, should come as a more or less shocking surprise. I have no intention to glorify H.H. H. No doubt he is horrible, he is abject, he is a shining example of moral leprosy a mixture of ferocity and jocularity that betrays supreme misery, perhaps, but is not conducive to attractiveness. He is ponderously capricious. Many of his casual opinions on people and scenery of this country are ludicrous. A desperate honesty that throbs through his confession does not absolve him from sins of diabolical cunning. He is abnormal. He is not a gentleman." But how magically his singing violin can conjure up a tendresse, a compassion for Lolita that makes us entranced with the book while abhorring its author.